So hello, everybody. Um, my name is Eva Maria Novoa, and I am a group leader at the Center for Genomic Regulation and CRG in Spain. And today I would like to talk to you about uh, decoding the epitranscriptome at single molecule resolution uh, using nanopore technologies. So thank you uh, for the opportunity to present this work to everybody. Um, so in our lab, we, we actually work on, on the epitranscriptome, which is the term that we use uh, to collectively refer to the RNA modifications. So in the last years, we have started to realize that RNA modifications are not just structural features, uh, but are also dynamic features that can be regulated and can be put on and, and removed from the RNA molecules. Therefore, they actually um, expand the RNA lexicon and they can have diverse functions affecting things like translation or degradation rates uh, and, and translatability of the RNA. So there's more than 170 different known RNA modifications so far, and this list keeps expanding. Uh, this uh, table here is already four years old, so it, it needs to be updated. But basically, the idea is that a vast majority of RNA modifications are associated to human diseases, yet we don't have enough uh, techniques to detect the vast majority of them uh, here circled in, in green. So why is there this gap between the modifications we're interested in and those that are actually associated to disease? So the reason is because we actually lack uh, proper methods to study them in a transcriptome-wide fashion. So current methods uh, typically use uh, either antibodies or chemicals that are selected towards a specific modification, and they will then recognize the modification, uh, and afterwards we will couple it with next-generation sequencing, allowing us to map uh, the specific locations where the antibodies were binding or where the chemicals reacted with uh, the modification of interest. However, this means that you need either a selective antibody or a selective chemical, which is often not available, even though in the last year, the, the list has uh, started to expand. So already back in 2017, uh, uh, direct RNA nanopore sequencing technologies appeared. And basically this uh, technology had the potential to overcome uh, the vast majority of limitations that uh, existing methods uh, using uh, Illumina-based sequencing were presenting to study modifications. Firstly, because it's, uh, there's no PCR, because you sequence the native RNA molecules, and this will mean that you, in principle, can capture all RNA modifications. Uh, moreover, it will give a single read resolution, so you should be able not only to detect the modifications, but actually um, quantify them in a highly accurate way and associate which modifications are found in which isoform. <clears throat> Moreover, it is able to detect different modifications in, 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 in the same transcript in principle, and also it gives an additional information such as poly A tail length information. So in theory, um, like the technology has the potential to detect RNA modifications, but when we started uh, using nanopore sequencing, this actually was not completely clear to us. So the first question we asked ourselves is, okay, can we actually detect RNA modifications using nanopore sequencing? So the theory says that uh, when you have a given modification, it should actually cause a, an alteration in the current intensity uh, at the position where the modification is found. And therefore, you should be able to identify where the modification is found based on alterations in the current intensity. And this here is just a cartoon depicting this idea. However, in order to do this, uh, this means that you need to actually align or resquiggle the current intensities, which back then when we started working on this was not that easy, perhaps because also the base calling algorithms were not so good, and you also need to match the FASTA to the current intensity. So instead of that, we actually thought that maybe we could use some a different approach than actually looking into changes in current intensity. <clears throat> and our solution was actually to look at systematic base calling errors. Because one thing that we realize is that be because the base color does not know what to do when it encounters a modification, it tends to make systematic errors. So here you can see how in three different uh, independent replicates, uh, in, in a position that is known to have a pseudouridin, you can actually see that it actually leads to a systematic base calling error, in this case in the form of uh, U2C mismatch. So, with, so we decided to build a software, which we call the Pinano, uh, which actually exploits these systematic errors to detect uh, modifications. 
So the way it started was actually uh, using uh, Epinano to detect M6A modifications. And for this, we actually made, um, we trained the algorithm uh, using M6A modified data, uh, in vitro synthetic one, as well as unmodified data. And then we collect different types of features, including some current intensity signals, as well as base call data. And we feed all that into machine learning algorithm that will classify KMERS based on whether we believe they are modified or unmodified. And using that, we show that actually we can uh, recapitulate positions which were previously reported to be M6A modified. So however, we, we, the, the proof of concept of uh, this application of using systematic based calling errors was shown um, with M6A, but then is this applicable to other modifications? So I already showed that, that so the Yurden uh, was able, was actually causing a CTU mismatch. So I, I already kind of gave the answer before, but the truth is that in general, we have been examine, examining different types of modifications and they tend to all uh, be able to cause like, um, systematic uh, errors that can be detected in one form or the other. So in some cases, it leads to a single nucleotide position that has an error, like in the case of pseudouridine or 2 prime methylation, 2 prime methyl adenosine. But then in other cases, like uh, here, we can see the UM modification. The error is actually spread throughout several positions. And we actually know that the, it's actually all the positions are caused, that all these errors in, in the four different positions are caused by the presence of UM because when we actually remove the modification at this position using a knockout strain that lacks this SNRNA, which guides these modifications specifically, uh, all the four uh, errors are lost, meaning that this whole signal here is actually the UM modification. So as I was saying, basically we found that modifications can uh, cause base calling error features, but they don't always uh, cause it in the same way. So sometimes they are spread throughout several positions, but also sometimes they appear in, in the different forms. So for example, so the urine appears in the form of mismatch frequencies, but M5C, for example, tends to appear in the form of insertions and not increased mismatch frequencies. So we need to understand which type of, um, of signals it will leave in the base calling errors. Uh, if we want to actually be able to identify which RNA modification type it is. So it seems that we can predict different types of modifications uh, in individual sites, but what about in individual reads? Because that in principle is, is, is what one would want to do given that you have single, uh, single read resolution with nanopore sequencing. So as I mentioned a uh, time ago, we were not able to look into this because um, we found a lot of issues when we were trying to re-squiggle the reads. But then uh, more recently, um, probably because the base calling algorithms also improved quite a bit, we were able to um, look again into this specific question and, and we analyzed the, the current intensities of wild type and knockout strains. So we can see is like wild type reads uh, shown here in purple actually tend to generate current intensities uh, that follow more or less the same pattern and shape. And here in green, we can see like this huge peak here in this position, which actually corresponds to the position that has a pseudouridine. So here, the, we would also have a position that is centered in pseudouridine, but its position is not affected by the knockout. So you can see that the reads that lack the modification have this peak, <coughs> apologies, and, and the ones that are actually modified, shown in purple, have a different shape at this specific position, meaning that one can actually use the current intensity information of individual reads to actually cluster them based on whether they are modified or non-modified. And by using that, you can actually then estimate the modification uh, at different sites. So here I'm, I'm showing the precise stoichiometry of, diff of three different ribosomal RNA positions. And here you can see that in the knockout strains, basically we see no, we predict no um, modification level. And then in the wild type strains, so those that have the modification, you can actually see a prediction of high levels of modification in agreement with mass spectrometry data that has been previously published. However, I went kind of fast um, between saying how we predict stoichiometry, because in reality, I oversimplified it uh, as if we were only using signal intensity. However, this is not really the case. So signal intensity um, at position zero uh, would work for the example that I was showing before, but it would not work for all modifications even if it's the same type of modification. So here I'm showing uh, di different positions with pseudouridine. And for example, here we can see that 
In the knockout strain, there is a shift in current intensity at position zero for this modification, but we don't see that in the other two knockout strains, although they should actually have a shift in the current intensity at position zero. So first we wondered, okay, what if we look at neighboring position? Well, that is useful for some cases, like now the SN34 knockout, we're able to find here the shift in the current intensity, but still for other positions like this one, we find no clear uh, shift in current intensity. So we said, okay, maybe we need to explore additional features apart from signal intensity. So we looked into dwell time, uh, which has been reported also as a, as a useful feature to capture uh, modification information. Um, but then again, for example, for this position, we were not able to see clear differences between the wild tap and knockout. So then we actually uh, identified a, a much less explored feature, which is trace, which is actually the, the probability um, that is reported by Guppy base color of being a specific base. So using this feature, we actually find that trace is highly informative and captures uh, the, the differences between the wild type knockout, allowing us then to really identify positions that are modified and non-modified. And here you can see in control position, the differences between wild type and knockout are basically a none. So not only which features uh, we're using uh, to predict modifications are important, but also which risk quiggling algorithm we use is important. So at the beginning we were using NanoPolish, uh, but then we actually switched to Tombow because we realized that Tombow is much more robust at uh, risk quiggling uh, uh, reads across different positions and in terms of risk quiggling reads that are wild type and knockout. So for example, here what you can see is that for, for a given transcript, Tombow either risk quiggles the read or it doesn't risk quiggle the read, which me means that the proportion of risk quiggle reads does not change across positions. <clears throat> but more importantly, the proportion of risk quiggle reads that are knockout to wild type does not really change in Tombow. And this is especially important if you want to identify stoichiometry, because for example, in this position, what we found was that um, Nanopolish would preferentially risk quiggle on modified reads, which means that um, if you risk quiggle seven times more um, uh, reads that do not have the modification, then basically you will underestimate seven times the stoichiometry at this position. So we then de develop our so a software called NanoRMS uh, to predict RNA modifications uh, using these features and using Tombow's risk quiggling algorithm. And we tested different machine learning algorithms, finding that we can actually recapitulate um, stoichiometries even uh, when the stoichiometry is relatively low. So we validated uh, our software uh, at known modified sites in uh, ribosomal RNAs, snow RNAs, as well as mRNAs. So here you can see that we can recapitulate previously reported sites such as these post one dependent site and in the knockout strain you can see that it's lost the signal. But then we also identified new sites that were not previously reported in the literature like this one. <coughs> And some of them we validated using uh, orthogonal approaches. So here you can see that the predicted stoichiometry for non-target sites is very low, and that for novel sites as well as uh, previously reported sites, we find um, uh, we predict a stoichiometry that goes somewhere between five percent to thirty percent. So can we then now that use all these algorithms to study RNA modification dynamics? So the short answer is yes. So basically, we can now compare two different uh, conditions, which people can then choose whatever they want, cancer, non-cancer, or different tissues or whatever. And we can see, for example, that in this case, uh, and under normal situation, we don't have a modification. And when we put the cells under heat shock, basically, they express the modification here. So some of them were known, previously reported to be already heat responsive. But then again, we identified novel positions that were not previously reported to be uh, heat sensitive. And of note, other types of, of RNA, like ribosomal RNA, we did not find them to be um, heat sensitive or responsive to any of the environmental stresses that we actually um, examined. So in short, in summary, um, I hope that uh, with this uh, talk, I have convinced you that RNA modifications are actually um, regulatory dynamic features that can be used to expand the RNA lexicon and that in our lab, we're actually interested in characterizing them using novel approaches such as nanopore sequencing to then answer questions that before we couldn't study in, in, in a proper way, maybe because we didn't have a method to map that modification or because the method was not quantitative. 
so with this, I would like to finally thank the people who actually did the work. So thanks to all the people from my lab, as well as the collaborators, the funding who supported this work, as well as my husband uh, for all his support all this time. And thank you all for your attention.